are in listen only mode. Hello, I'm Carly Rogers, CAPSA's Marketing and Education Manager. Welcome to the Long-Term Availability of Copper webinar sponsored by ABC Metals. We are pleased to welcome Jim Mickle and Andrea Vicari um, as our guest presenters. Jim Mickle is the Manager Technical Services for the Copper Development Association. He's worked in the metals and corrosion industries since 1973, including the copper and brass, zinc, and steel industries. He's held positions in research and development, technical service, product development, market development, and sales and sales development, as well as operated his own metallurgical consulting business. Additionally, Jim taught metallurgy courses for ASM International for 10 years. He joined the Copper Development Association in January 2007, and he's presented um, a few different times for us, so we are pleased to have him back with us today. Andrea Vicari has more than 17 years of experience in the mining and metals industry with an emphasis on developing and maintaining sustainable development and health, safety, environment, and quality strategies and programs. She spent seven plus years with Rio Tinto and has significant experience in life cycle assessment across various industries. Andrea is currently an independent consultant and she will be starting a new role as the International Copper Association's Director of Health, Environment and Sustainable Development on April 1st. So that's awesome, congratulations, Andrea. Jim and Andrea will answer your questions at the conclusion of their presentation. Please type in and submit your questions using uh, the questions tab on your GoToWebinar control panel. One hour after the presentation ends, you will receive a survey. Once you complete the survey, there will be a link to view and download today's presentation slides. I'm recording the webinar. Uh, that will also be available on CAPS's website and on our YouTube channel. And I will email all attendees uh, once that link is available, letting you know that it is out there for you. Uh, without further ado, I would now like to turn the presentation over to Jim Mickle. Well, good morning, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, we are going to talk about long-term availability of copper, and the subtitle is, Are We Running Out? Um, OK, we're basically, here's the outline for the uh, talk today. We're going to just have a bit of an overview, which is what I'm doing now. We're going to go through some common views on copper resources or common comments. And we'll go into a center section of what factors in, in uh, influence or what causes confusion in views of copper resources and why people think we might be running out. These include short-term availability of reserves versus long-term resources, various debates in academia, and various other non-authoritative sources of data. Then we'll go into new approach, a new approach to understanding the long-term availability of copper and many resources. The U United States Geological Survey overview and estimates and then conclusion and, of course, your questions at the end. So let me go to some of the common views or comments on copper that I've heard. And some of these come directly from trade shows that I've attended, people coming up to a CDA booth or various other um, uh, programs we've given or, or places we've been. The first is the copper price is so high, and this was some time ago, we must be running out. I've had this ask of me several times and many times very pointedly at trade shows, uh, no matter what the trade show booth was about. Um, and the implicit comment after this or concern was why are you even advertising the uh, use of copper if the copper price is so high and we're running out, which is their con conclusion. Um, while the price has been high, it is lower now. Uh, the price is not directly related to our supply 
of copper materials. Some of the price is uh, based upon commodity pricing, and that's directed through the commodity trading system. Um, so we'll get into that later. We don't use much copper anymore. I don't see any. This was a very nice lady uh, on a train uh, when she found out I was involved in copper. Well, I had to explain that all the wires um, and all the communications equipment and much of the power equipment and even in your car, in the house, in buildings, that's all copper. Uh, you wouldn't have lights uh, in your ceilings or uh, your communications in your phone, uh, computer, telephone, etc. All that is based upon copper as a conductor. Uh, so you don't see those because they're inside the device, inside the walls of your house. All our copper is mined overseas. Well, a good bit of copper is mined overseas. In fact, the majority has been over the last decade or so. However, that is not true. Copper is mined in the southwest and west of the United States, uh, mined in Canada, western Canada, or in various areas in Canada. Not necessarily is the main uh, metal that is mined. Sometimes it's secondary to nickel. And it's mined in South America. It's mined in Europe, to a degree, in uh, Africa, and in Asia and Australia. So it, there are deposits all over. We don't make anything anymore. So where does our copper come from? South America? Well, we make less here than we did before. That is true. So manufacturing is decreased. And South America is a major source of copper uh, mining. So there are grains of truth in the, that statement, but it's not correct. And the last one, which was uh, told to me by a microbiologist, plastics are better for the environment. We don't need copper anymore. Um, however, plastics are made out of oil or oil products. And I'm not necessarily sure that plastics in, from that regard are better for the environment as mining copper because you have to produce the oil to, before you get the plastics. In any event, those are various comments we've heard. And we'll go on and talk about the uses or, or the uh, reserves of copper. This is a chart uh, developed from a US Geological Survey, which shows a classification technique or uh, uh, way to classify resources and reserves of ma major elements and mineral resources. And there's two definitions or explanations, one at the top and one at the bottom our resource, which is shown at the top, is a concentration of naturally occurring solid, liquid, or gaseous material in or on the Earth's crust in such a form and amount that economic extraction of a commodity from that concentration is currently or potentially feasible. A resource is a very large source of material. A reserve, which is defined at the bottom, is part of an identified resource that could be economically extracted or produced at the time of determination. The term reserves need not signify that extraction facilities are in place and operative. In other words, mines may not be there yet. Reserves include only recoverable materials. OK, so a reserve is something it has been highly identified. Usually, um, the mine is located in that area or to, or to be developed in that area. Whereas a resource is something that's been generally identified, 
but may not be uh, developed yet. You can further segment a reserve into various levels. One that's economic. In other words, you can recover for in, uh, this particular exercise copper economically from that reserve. And you can do that um, based upon the pricing and, and uh, cost structures that you have. Then there's marginally economic. That means it's there's less copper in the ore in certain areas of the reserve, and it's marginal. And then there's sub-economic. We know there's copper there, but it's there in too low a percentage to go after unless the copper price goes back up. Um, you have undiscovered um, resources on the right, identified on the left. So you have identified resources somewhere on the globe that have copper in them. On the right, which you don't have very delin much delineation on, undiscovered resources. And we'll talk about that as we go along. So oh, it advanced twice. Sorry. Reserves, resources, and crustal content. We're talking about the crust of the Earth. We, you look at the bottom of this diagram, you have extractable global resource, which in its overall sense is rather unknowable. There's a lot there. Some of it's been identified, and that's what we call a reserve. Um, where when you get up to the reserve part, you, it's somewhat restricted. It's accurate. We know what it is. You have a location. You have a, probably a mine already operating there, or you've developed some information about it. A resource is also maybe identified or unidentified, but you may have an idea where it is, but you don't have a whole lot more about it. You have a general idea that well, we have some good stuff there. But on the left, I'd like to point out there are drivers or influencers of fluctuation of what's called a reserve or a resource. You have demand. You have politics and governance. Where can we get things from? Right at this point, uh, we can get things or materials from almost anywhere on the globe and move them to almost anywhere else. But at other times in our history, we were not able to do that. Discovery technology. We're always getting better technology at finding things. We're always looking for better extraction technology. Uh, the mines now operate at a, a better extraction characteristic than ever before once they start mining the ore. You have to worry about access to energy. Is it a better, uh, or do we have to build a power plant near that mine? Cost of capital. Are the banks uh, costing us lots of money? And exchange rates. Is it better to mine here in the United States or North America versus somewhere else in the world? because of exchange rates. These are all factors to think about. Data sources driving confusion. We'd like to get into this area often. And uh, various authors or journalists confuse reserves with resources, or vice versa. Reserves are an indicator of short-term availability only generally a window of uh, 10 to 30 years, maybe, not too long. So this is from, or a chart developed, and you can find it online, uh, as you can see at the bottom of the chart. Um, how much material is left? We're looking at energy. The, these folks, visual capitalists, did a forecast. 
we're running out of oil about 2052. But I remember back in uh, the 1970s when we had oil crises, we were running out of oil in 1985. So the discovery and development of and economics have made oil exploration and uh, usage better for us. Coal, we have plenty of coal. They're basically stating that. Natural gas seems to be out to 2070, but up until fracking came along, we didn't have that much. Uranium, since we're not using as much, it can last quite a while. But other materials look like we're running out fairly quickly. Well, let's look at another view from someone else. And this is um, the Center for Advanced Mining and Metallurgy in Sweden. In 2005, they, they noted that the global known reserves of copper were estimated at 470 million metric tons. All right. They also noted that the global production from mines, copper mines, was 14.9 million metric tons. So with a simple calculation, the 470 over the 14.9, we ended up with 32 years world will run out of copper in 2037. Not necessarily true. Um, we go on to the same organization, but uh, a, a published uh, document from the magazine New Scientist in uh, May of 20, 2007. They did a nice colorful chart. and. The uh, bar at the very top of this diagram shows that copper, depending upon how you read it, we're running out in 38 years to 61 years. You'll also notice they're looking at population densities down at the bottom right. They're also including various diagrams on the right side of elements that are recycled or what percent is recycled. And copper is noted as 31%. These are things all play into that particular uh, equation. But this is not quite right either. Um, now Andrea will jump in here with some more academic information. Thanks, Jim. Good morning, everyone. Um, so Jim has presented to us um, a nice overview of where some of the confusion starts to come in play when we're trying to answer this question, are we running out of copper? Um, this confusion between what is a reserve versus what is a resource. And when we make measurements or we do estimates based on reserves, the reserves are very much constantly fluctuating. They are a measure of current availability, not long-term availability, um, because they don't incorporate things like exploration, new mines that are coming on, new technologies that are developed, all those things that Jim walked through with us previously. In the academic world, there has been this ongoing battle, um, and in particular between a few scientists um, about copper over the years. And uh, we've got listed here three papers that were sort of the beginning of this ongoing battle, uh, which is still in, in some ways ongoing. Um, and essentially, what we see is there's a, a group of scientists that have kind of a, a fixed stock view of the world, um, that we only have so much and we are most definitely running out. And then there's this other view, which is much more an opportunity cost, more of a traditional economic view, that in fact we're not running out. We can't measure it the same way today that we measure it tomorrow because technology changes, we change, politics changes, etc. So these are just three um, papers that 
really drove a lot of debate that happened in the um, first decade of the 21st century around copper specifically. Um, and I'll summarize them here on this uh, next slide. Essentially, if I can get it to work, I apologize, there we go. Essentially, Gordon, Bertram, and Gradle um, really look at it from very much a, a limits to growth view, which some of you will remember from the 1970s and 80s, very much this view that, you know, a little bit of a doomsday view that we, we our, our population is growing so fantastically um, that our technology can't keep up, we won't be able to feed people, house people, um, and that scarcity will rise, raise the prices of metals. Um, recycling will increase significantly, which it, it certainly has in the, in the last 20, 30 years. Um, and essentially that rising prices won't cause sudden economic disruption, instead we'll transition away from certain materials to other materials, and so in the case of copper, we would transition away to uh, com competing metals such as aluminum. Um, they also forecasted what they deemed to be other scarce metals that essentially zinc and platinum uh, were soon to be depleted. Um, but that silver and nickel were adequate for 50 to 100 years. But, but what we've in fact seen is, is that zinc and platinum have not been depleted. Um, there are still plenty of resources available for platinum and zinc as well as reserves. John Tilton uh, and Gustavo Lagos came back and said, okay, uh, we understand that you have much more of this fixed stock view of the world. In our view of the world, what we see is the role for new technology. We see real price trends over the last 130 years that have seen very little change in copper availability. Um, you know, arguing that although scarcity may happen at certain times, it doesn't lead to uh, a massive panic um, or a disruption in supply. They also uh, put forth that new technology um, will have this cost-reducing effect and, and therefore offset cost increasing effects of depletion, which is you know, very logical in the, the economic mindset. And in their view, the, the most significant factors of influence are, of course, world population growth um, and the economic development that comes as a result of that, and which therefore obviously drives the demand for metals like copper. But also, um, as Jim mentioned previously, the US Geological Survey, um, who does very important work on an ongoing basis to determine what are the available resources or what are the, the global resources for every uh, significant element. And so every year they do a, um, an update to the fact sheets that they produce and they publish them online which show what currently known resources are uh, in addition to, of course, reserves. And so resources being the biggest number, like Jim showed in the, the diagram previously with the arrow, so resources is the biggest number and then reserves are a subset. Um, and at the time we were looking at greater than 3.7 billion tons, so more than double the 1.6 billion tons assumed by Gradle, um, which is the, the information presented on the left. And so essentially this ongoing debate <clears throat> went on and, and Tilton had been um, working on this new theory for a while in his academic work at the School of Mines um, here in Colorado and also in his work in South America in, in the copper and other industries. And essentially, the way that he looked at it, and he, he first published this work in 2001 and then has published many, many uh, papers since then on it, but essentially what he said is we need a new way to try to picture or envision long-term availability of, of minerals and metals. Instead of just looking at our traditional supply-demand graphs, you know, like prices, et cetera, that have a, um, a shorter time frame on them, you know, the 20, 30-year time frame, we need to be able to look more into the 100, 200, 300-year time frame to be able to have an understanding of what is the potential long-term availability of, of a mineral or a metal. And, you know, he basically, you know, his, this is his foundational argument that we simply don't know whether or not coming generations will face the future of mineral commodity shortages. It depends on our faith in technology. Um, and that basically underlies all of his work. And so for the next couple of slides, I'll explain to you what his, his basic theory is and why we're so interested in it. 
um, as an industry. So what what he what Tilton came up with was something called the cumulative availability curve. And essentially, you see the curve here on the, the right-hand side of the slide. It's essentially a chart of cost or price on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, we basically have cumulative availability. And so essentially what it does is it, it shows the total quantity available at various prices over all time. So as opposed to just looking at a shorter-term uh, view of prices and the effective demand on price, it really actually looks at multiple factors. It looks at, um, you see them listed here basically, new discoveries, effects of technology, restrictions on access, rising energy costs, cost of capital, exchange rates, et cetera. And it attempts to basically plot on the um, almost unlimited time scale where we might run into disruption or if we essentially have a nice gra gradual curve. Um, they've actually developed these curves now for lithium um, oil and gas and a few other uh, minerals. They've not done it for copper yet. We're hoping that will happen next. Um, but it can take, uh, just to give you an example, to develop this kind of a curve because it goes out 100 to 200 to 300 years or more. Um, it takes a very long time to gather all the data. And so the lithium curve that they developed took uh, a master's student uh, as well as a few postdocs, I believe, uh, over two years to gather all the data to put together the lithium curve. But essentially, <clears throat> what it, what it uh, theorize, or theorizes is that scarcity, which is measured by cost and price, depends on movement up the curve, shifts in the curve, and the slope and the shape of the curve. So as I mentioned uh, previously, one of the things that we're very interested in is if we see what we would call a discontinuity or a uh, stop in the curve. And what I mean by that is literally what you see here. So for example, what if we have this um, essentially stop in the curve or a, a sharp rise in the curve? And what can cause that? Um, there are, um, for example, technology advances, um, you know, where we essentially run into only deposits left of a certain grade. And so to be able to actually economically produce them, we have to have a significant shift in technology. Um, and so what he's tried to do is try to understand how that then would affect cumulative availability. So for copper, uh, one of the interesting things that, that, that Tilton highlights is, um, you know, typically you have these two basic types of copper ores, right? We have sulfitic ores and we have oxidic ores. The sulfide ores are the ones that we are most uh, that are most commonly mined in North and South America. Kennecott Utah Copper, for example, in Salt Lake City is sulfitic ore. And they are essentially the ore bodies that we find, the large ore bodies that we find and seek out um, globally. Well, one of the interesting things about copper that has been theorized by a gentleman named Brian Skinner, and this is back in the uh, 70s, um, and has continued to be not proven, so we're not sure if this is really the case or not, but essentially for the less abundant elements in the crust, there is this concern that potentially what will happen is we will get to a point where we don't have these massive deposits anymore, um, these big porphyry, sulfitic, you know, significant deposits that we can mine for 100 to 200 years. Instead, what will happen is we'll be left with just the copper that's available in common rock. And when I mean common rock, I mean literally pick up a piece of granite so when you're out hiking in the forest um, and you know, you're going to have uh, a various uh, elements within that rock. Uh, and so essentially what Skinner said is his concern is that at some point we'll reach what we call this mineralogical barrier. So this is kind of a confusing graph, but if you follow, follow me just for a moment here, the line that's coming from the top left is for common rock. So for example, this is the energy consumption that is required per pound of copper for to extract from common rocks versus sulfitic ores. So for example, what you see here, so the, the line coming from the top left for common rock is basically showing you that at a very, very, very low ore grade percentage, which you see on the x-axis, uh, 0.001, um, maybe a little bit higher than that, um, 
you see that the energy required per ton to develop that is massive, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's significantly higher than what it takes to get it from a sulfitic ore, which you see here, you know, typically the, the ore bodies range from 0.1 to, um, you know, 4 or 5%. Um, and you see the energy associated with extracting that is much lower. So you see 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5 versus to get it from a common rock um, being more in the, the 10 to 6.5 or 10 to 7, 10 to 8 range. And we can basically sum that up, you know, factor 10, essentially, you have this huge jump. And it seems very logical, right, if we're going to go from um, obtaining copper from massive, huge deposits down to trying to extract it chemically from a common rock, you're going to have a huge, huge difference in cost. And so Brian Skinner basically came forward and said that this is a, this is a significant concern to us, that, that it's possible that we might meet this neurological barrier. And so then Tilton works to say, okay, what would this look like? Uh, in the case of the cumulative availability curve. And so essentially what you would see in that case is you'd see what we call the bimodal curve. Um, so on the right-hand side of the screen there, you basically see the amount of metal available at a given grade, um, and then you see these, these two, um, basically two peaks. So one at a, at a high peak and then one at a low peak. And so that's concerning in the sense that, uh, you know, it's possible um, you know, once we've exhausted the, cop the known copper resources that are available in the ore types, um, the massive ore types that we talked about before, which are the sulfitic and the oxidic, we might get to a point where we have to extract from common rock. But what Tilton would argue is that's okay, because technology will help us figure that out. We will be able to figure that out. It, it's, it's, uh, we have to have some faith in our human ingenuity that as prices rise because the material is becoming more scarce or less available, um, we will put time, effort, and energy into technology to figure out how to extract it um, in an economically useful way. Um, and so essentially, just to sum up, this is a bit of an academic discussion, but it's a, it's a useful curve for us in the copper industry because it helps us try to look out on that broader horizon, um, especially when, when people talk about the mineralogical barrier or talk about just running out in general. Um, and essentially, the shape of the curve is affected by the nature of mineralization and other geological factors. Movement up or down the curve is affected by all those factors that we talked about before and essentially those factors that Jim presented to you in terms of reserves. Um, you know, politics, technology, uh, cost of capital, et cetera. Potentially also recycling, of course. Um, shifts in the curve can result from changes in input costs and technological advances. In the lithium curve, the thing that's very interesting is that, you know, in about 100 years, essentially what they see is, is that um, technology will become available where we can extract lithium from seawater. Um, and they, they, they look out to that, you know, that far out in advance. And that can be a useful thing to do when you're facing skepticism about long-term availability. Um, it calls into question commonly held beliefs that are viewed to be a significant challenge. And it provides a window in. So essentially, if the curve is benign, so we just see a nice basic curve, um, there is no threat of depletion. If the curve is discontinuous or rises sharply, there may be a threat to depletion but it may be hundreds and hundreds of years out. And so trying to understand where that is as an industry um, to help focus uh, our work to understand availability is, is very important. And I'm gonna hand it over to Jim now, who's going to talk about why we're not so concerned in the next several hundred years. Okay, thank you. Well, let's put this into context. We've been through academia. Um, let's go. Oh, no, you still got to do this one, Jim. Yep. I'm getting uh, the arrows doing uh, various things to me. Um, U.S. Geological Survey estimates of undiscovered copper, which uh, was published several years ago, but wasn't widely disseminated because uh, and that's one of the reasons why we're talking today. The um, 
let's go through some of these figures. Recyclable copper is present in the infrastructure, currently estimates of 3,700 million tons. That is five times greater than the copper reserves, identified reserves of 670 million tons. So what, we, what are we talking about infrastructure? Well, just what I was talking about previously, the copper in wire, the copper in plumbing, the copper in your car, the you know, copper in motors, the copper that is used in sculptures or other things. That's the infrastructure material that's available for recycle. We'll talk about a little further in that uh, in one of the diagrams in the next few slides. In addition to identified copper resources of 2,100 million metric tons, which is hard to fathom, a mean of 3,500 million metric tons of undiscovered copper is expected. So what the USGS did several years ago, and it was a multi-year project, US obviously is United States Geological Survey, now they did a cooperative program with a variety of similar organizations around the globe, uh, but uh, as their charge, it's to determine what is available to us in an overall. And that's what they did. Uh, so the they looked at this and came up with this 3,500 million metric tons of undiscovered copper all over the globe in various forms. Okay, this is stuff that maybe in Mexico or maybe in uh, in Africa or somewhere not been exploited, not been fully uh, evaluated, if you will, and some of it just is not fully known about. This can be under the sea, it can be in deep, uh, deep areas. So the annual U.S. copper consumption, as opposed to all these big figures, is 2 million metric tons global consumption is 20 million metric tons. Um, so that puts it a little bit in perspective. We're using or mining copper and using it at a certain rate. Um, and that's annually, but that's not every year we do exactly that. It's been up and down. Uh, Pyrofree copper deposits, in other words, the sulfurous copper deposits, account for about 60% of the world's copper. Um, and that's the majority of the mining, majority of the deposits here in the United States and other parts of the world are sulfur-bearing copper deposits. Um, there's also sediment-hosted strata-bound copper deposits that account for about 20% of the world's identified copper resources. So the overall mining in these two deposit areas types produce about 12 million metric tons of copper per year. All right. So and right now the copper mining uh, is diminishing because of an economic slowdown. So we're mining less at the present time. Um, that affects things. So let's put this all in context as uh, Hammerstrom did in 2015. I'm glad this uh, animation is working. Um, world copper, world mo copper mine production of all types is the blue line. And you will note it's uh, charted all the way back to 1880 when records actually started. Copper mining started in uh, biblical times or even before. Um, so gradually we've been mining more and more. Um, 
and it's overcast uh, charts showing the production and the blue chart, blue line on this graph, and the undiscovered is red. And the factoid there is the estimated undiscovered copper resources in the two main types of copper, um, the oxidic or uh, sulfurous type ores, is six times the amount of copper produced from all types of copper deposits since the beginning of mining. So the USGS seemed to be saying that well, everybody's a little uneasy about this, but it seems to be that we have a lot of copper out there, both discovered, known, and undiscovered materials. Another way to put this, which is uh, published in the World Copper Factbook uh, starting in 2014, and that's published by the International Copper Study Group, um, is this nice diagram. At the bottom, mine production, and this is not to scale, as you will note, 18.1 million metric tons, and that's diminished some. The mine capacity is 20.8 million metric tons. So always the mine capacity is a little bit larger than what is mean mined at the moment. The reserves, in other words, what is known to have copper in the ore or be mineable is 690 million metric tons. Okay. The identified resources are 2100 million metric tons. So we already know there's a lot of material out there. Um, this already tells you that there's a lot more out there than we really have as far as reserves and we're only mining a minor fraction of what is called reserves. Well, then we look at the total resources. These are identified and undiscovered. 5,600 million metric tons of material. Now, that is truly a very large figure. This would give us copper material, copper at our present rate for between 100 and 200 years. Um, so I feel a lot better. Uh, one comment, which is under the red headline up, up above, undiscovered resources do not include deep sea nodules and land-based and submarine massive sulfides containing copper. So these are all land-based undiscovered resources or identified resources. We didn't do a deep dive or project what's under the sea. And that's certainly, um, if there's some on the land, there's some under there as well. So we have undiscovered, undiscovered resources that we haven't even talked about, or they haven't even talked about. So we have quite a lot of material uh, available to us, and this certainly makes us feel a lot better as far as where we are in the amount of copper going forward. Well, let's talk about recycling because copper is one of those materials that is recycled uh, readily and has been since the beginning of time. Um, the key drivers for recycling are the mine expansion and production, substitution, did we find something else to make something out of? and Therefore, we have more actual copper to use for other things. Industrialization and economic growth. How fast are we growing? Do we need all this? Or have we slowed down? Or how have we changed? Prices. As the price goes up, and as one of my early comments said, 
price is so high, what are we doing? Well, uh, usually a high price on copper leads to some substitution of various other things. China. China is slowed down over where it was previously as far as manufacturing and uh, GDP. So if they get uh, very busy in, in the future, copper will be used at a higher rate again. The regional scrap processing capacity or capability. We have reasonably good uh, copper recovery programs here in the United States. Likewise in uh, Europe. Uh, in other parts of the world, I'm not so sure they have as good a recovery programs as we do. Japan, um, parts of China now, um, but in Africa, I'm not sure, so sure. Regulations on recycling and trade. Are we required to recycle uh, and do we trade things away or how do we govern trade? Uh, and that has a big impact on how we recycle materials. And technology. Do we take already used copper and how do we treat that? Some copper has plating on it. Some of it is in wire form with lacquer on it. How do we, um, how do, we do that or how do we put that through a furnace, remelt it, and reprocess it? Uh, do we have technology to take care of those other things that are on that copper material? Um, all things to think about. Well, and here's a big chart that came out of the International Copper Study Group uh, booklet. Uh, copper recycling flows. Essentially, uh, when you look at the product on the left, product supply, what's coming into this box with orange uh, boxes is um, sheet, strip, plate, tube, uh, or various other copper and copper alloy materials that are then made into construction uh, pieces or parts of construction equipment or, and, and uh, fittings, electrical and electronic equipment, industrial equipment, transport, cars, trucks, trains, planes, consumer and general goods, and other uses. During that manufacturing process, there's scrap generated. There's finished products. The finished products go into what's in the red boxes, copper reservoir in use. That's the wiring in your house, the wiring in your car, the motors with copper windings, the uh, copper in your computer and your phone. That's in use. Now copper in use many times is there for between 10 and 100 years. So the recycle rate depends upon how long we use something. And some, as the one box says, is abandoned, stored, reused, end of life products. If it's abandoned in place, so to speak, or maybe it's reused. Maybe that motor is being reused somewhere else. So it's not re uh, taken apart, but somebody else with a different requirement is reusing it. But an automobile sitting in a uh, wrecking yard is stored and the copper has not been recovered yet until that car is taken apart and sent back to be reused or remelted. And then at the end of life, all these products are in the yellow, are adjusted in various ways of how we do things uh, to recover them. Um, OK, so there's a lot of scrap handling. So we're. At the conclusion of the uh, webinar here, 
after all of this uh, discussion, we are not running out of copper. The U.S. Geological Survey study uh, has shown or has developed a way of looking at things that indicate we have plenty of copper going forward and that maybe we didn't look at everything for availability of copper anyway. Its availability in the short term is dependent on a number of economic and socio-political factors as well as development of new technology. In the long term, the availability can be estimated using devices such as Tilton's cumulative availability curve. However, the underlying uh, note is the USGS, the US Geological Survey, and the ICSG, the International Copper Study Group, are the authoritative voices on world copper resources. Um, the academia debate, the debate in, on the train as I'm going home, the debate uh, with the lady saying we never see any copper anymore, um, doesn't hold water necessarily. You need an authoritative source to tell you where we are. Um, OK, I think we're done. Uh, if we have any comments, questions, I turn this back over to Carly. Thank you, Jim and Andrea. Um, we did have a question come through um, partway through the presentation. Do you think the extreme price fluctuations of copper are more to do with supply demand issues or due to speculators and the dollar strength or weakness? Yes. <laughs> all of those things. All of those, all of the above. Quite okay. simply, yes. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, when you ask multiple questions at, at one time, it's very easy to say yes to everything and let somebody figure it out. Uh, but they're already scratching their heads and saying, how does that work? Um, obviously, there's an economic or a industrial slowdown. Um, the demand for copper in construction and various other activities right now, primarily wiring, which is 51 to 52 percent of the, or the electronic use of copper, 50 to 52 percent of the use worldwide, um, has slowed down. Uh, China has slowed down. They're not building uh, mythical cities anymore. The, um, but the other comment about commodity pricing or commodity markets speculating in copper, gold, other metals, etc., is also there. Um, if you have speculators saying, well, we think it's going to go up, then the price can be bid up without any substantiation. And that's one of the direct answers I give to people that sometimes there's a spike and there's really no market drive for it. It's just the commodity side. So yes to everything. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, that was good. Thank you. If anyone else has any other questions, feel free to submit those now. Um, so kind of the copper price and you know it's decreasing and such can you be a little bit more specific jim like how it's affecting things like what we can kind of expect well i can't we're not supposed to talk about copper price okay per se um, but you're right the trend is down just as the oil price is downward mm -hmm. or has been um there, those two, oil price and copper price, are general markers of how activity is going in the world. So if you have an oil price that is down or has dropped dramatically, which it has, and is staying there, which it seems to be, uh, and copper price is similarly dropped and it seems to be staying down, 
uh, we have less economic or industrial activity supporting these things. Um, that doesn't mean that we're going to be losing our shirts here. It's um, we're in a little bit of a trough. The biggest factor affecting this, and which seems to have started several years ago, was China, the softening in China. When and China wouldn't tell anybody that they were doing this, um, so we had to get out our crystal balls and figure out what was going on. But eventually, we found out because they weren't ordering things, or they weren't ordering product from various mines, uh, copper mines specifically, and that certainly was a major indication. Anyway, I think that's a reasonable. Yeah. I was going to, um, for some of our members who are on the call, um, I just wanted to point out, in case you're not aware, um, we actually have a quarterly economic report that comes out from ITR Economics. Um, Alan Bolio um, runs that firm, and he is what we consider our chief economist for the association. And so uh, for CAPSA members, you're, um, that's a free resource to you that we make available um, the next report is in March, uh, and we actually focus um, the four quarters on specific markets. Uh, so I know that um, manufacturing and oil and gas and um, all of those are you know, prevalent, um, especially in 2016. So just an FYI to you guys, if you were not aware that we have that report available to you, you can feel free to reach out to me if you need access to that. Um, we'll also have Alan speaking at our upcoming convention. Um, so he is always one that our attendees look forward to hearing from. Um, he has like some crazy accuracy rate of like 97% or something. So um, there's more information about that event on CAPSA's website. But I just want to thank Jim. I want to thank Andrea um, for being our guest presenters today and for a wonderful presentation. Like I said, we are recording this. Um, and so I will have that available um, out on the website later today. And I will email everyone and let you know that it is out there. Uh, here in one hour after the webinar closes, uh, you'll receive a survey. Um, it's very brief, um, but it tells us you know what topics maybe you want to hear um, about in the future and then you also get a copy of today's slides so if anyone in your team was not able to join today's call feel free to share the recording and the slides with them um, I'd also like to thank ABC Metals who sponsored the presentation and thank all of you for joining us this morning. Uh, like I said, please visit um, www.copper-brass.org for um, our upcoming events and webinars. Um, I am working on a webinar in March, um, so please stay tuned for details about that up on the site. And with that, thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Jim. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Carly.